we are recording and oh my goodness we have so many people in the zoom room thank you all for joining please uh send becky some love i love to see people in the zoom room uh please tell us where you are logging in from today and i'm going to go ahead and immediately introduce becky and then turn this over to her so today we have becky kekula and becky did i say that correctly kekula <laughs> kekula Okay, and she's, yes. here, she's here today to talk to us about building a disability inclusive society. Becky will tell us about her own personal journey. She will also discuss disability inclusion in the schools and workplace, and she will also go over some practical steps to take to be more inclusive of people with disabilities. Becky Kikula is a motivational speaker and an advocate for inclusion everywhere. Becky received her Bachelor of Science in Marketing from Providence College, where she gained a passion for influencing change behind the scenes in the entertainment industry and large corporations. She has spoken at over 200 venues, such as companies, government agencies, and schools, and oh, and as far away as Africa. Ah, Becky worked for a decade in the entertainment and news, in, news media industries, and now she works to advance disability inclusion and equality in the corporate world. You all know me. I am Danette Edwards, the founder of Corona Days Professional Development Group. I am going to immediately turn this over to Becky and let her go. I'm going to mute myself and shut my camera off. Also, guys, today Becky would like to have a dedicated Q&A, so drop those questions in the Zoom room and in Facebook, and we will cover them at the end. Thank you for being here with us, Becky. I can't wait to, for you to begin. All right. Thank you so much for having me and hope everyone's doing well and safe. Uh, it's kind of a coincidence, the two people who wrote in the chat box, one person's from Wisconsin and one's in Boston. I'm actually currently in Wisconsin, but about to move back to Boston where I grew up. Uh, so welcome everyone. And uh, fortunately, the digital wor world allows us to all stay connected regardless of where we are. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, you may have been aware by looking me up before this presentation, but I am a person with dwarfism. Uh, that means that I stand four feet tall as an adult. I also identify as part of the disability community. I feel proud to be a part of a community uh, that has so much depth to it. And I was born into a family where dwarfism was not in the history of the family. My parents are average height and I have an older sister who is also average height. She's three and a half years older than I am. So when I was born, my parents were surprised. They didn't know what to do when they found out that I had dwarfism because they didn't know what that meant. And one of the reasons they didn't know what that meant is because the only perception they had seen of dwarfism before meeting me in the delivery room was in the media. And historically, people with dwarfism have been portrayed as freaks, leprechauns, elves. Not a ton of positive portrayals, especially back in 1984 when I was born. Fortunately, there was a nurse in the delivery room who had seen a little person be delivered before. And she was able to give my parents a little bit of hope. She knew exactly the type of dwarfism that I had, achondroplasia. It's the most common type of dwarfism. There are over 400 types of dwarfism, so if it was a little bit more specific than achondroplasia, the diagnosis may not have happened until a few years later. But I was fortunate to be diagnosed the day that I was born. After my parents left the hospital, a few days after they left the hospital, they went to seek guidance from a geneticist. And when they got to the hospital where they were meeting the geneticist, they entered the welcome area and met with the receptionist and asked the receptionist where to go to find the geneticist who they were about to go meet with. And the receptionist told them that they needed to follow the signs down the hallway that say birth defects. Then they need to go into the elevator and there's a button that says birth defects floor. And then there's gonna be another sign that says birth defects down the hallway. And then the genetic counselor will be there waiting for them. Those signs, made them very uneasy. Uh, they were struggling to even trust the geneticist who they were about to meet with because just the way that it was portrayed that th 
the only people who go to see a geneticist are those who have children with birth defects. Nobody wants to know that their newborn child has birth defects, regardless of, of the range of disability they may have. So my parents left that meeting and they did write a letter to the hospital and they said, you need to change the sign. You cannot tell people that their child has birth defects when they're just trying to seek out answers and someone they can trust to give them guidance. The journey continued. My parents did research for about six months until they were able to find a doctor in Baltimore, Maryland. So I was born in the Boston area. They went to Baltimore, Maryland. They found a doctor. They signed me up for a sleep study. And that was what allowed them to get an appointment with this doctor who was a specialist who saw people with dwarfism from around the world. The waiting room was extremely full when my parents went to the appointment for the sleep study. They were willing to wait as long as they needed. They were just excited to find a doctor who had an expertise in caring for patients with dwarfism. But the doctor looked at the full waiting room and saw my parents, saw the ghostly white looks on their faces, and he brought them into, their, into his office. And he asked them to ask him anything they had on their mind. And after that appointment, they were given even more answers. Nobody in the world has all the answers, but he was at least able to give them hope. And when they were at that appointment, they realized that because the waiting room's so full, any appointment that I may have there in the future, they would be waiting, willing to wait more than eight hours, however it was that we needed to wait in order to meet with that expert. And we continued to go every six months when I was younger, and then as I got older, we would go for an annual appointment. And one of the reasons I bring up this experience is that growing up, I did have several surgical procedures. I had a back brace when I was really young just to keep my body aligned. I had bowed legs. So when I was three years old, I had bone taken out of my legs. And then when I was 13 years old, I had bone put back in my legs. I have narrow ear canals, so I had tubes taken in and out of my ears. And then I had tonsils and adenoids, which some people may think of a common surgery that even people without dwarfism have. But one of the stigmas that exists uh, kind of around dwarfism in general, unless you have a mobility dis disability in addition to or a parent that you have hearing aids or other assistive devices, people try to tell us that we're not part of the disability community. But we are covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act and we are in fact part of the disability community. When I was 15, I, so I grew up participating in sports all alongside my average height peers. I really didn't get active in the Little People organization called Little People of America until I got older. And when I was 15 years old, right before I was going into my sophomore year in high school, I lost my ability to walk. I had spinal cord compression, which is another condition that's common, especially with my type of dwarfism, achondroplasia. We have average height torsos, but our organs are more compact. So my spinal column was pinching my spinal cord. I had seven pieces of my lower vertebrae removed in the October of my sophomore year in high school. And one of the reasons why I was so fearful of that surgery was falling behind in school. I took school very seriously and I wanted to continue to keep up with my average height peers. And while I was in school, I was promised that I would be able to get some tutors and other people would come to the house since I was going to miss 29 days of school to recover from the surgery. And not many people did end up coming to the house, but I was fortunately able to get back on track by the time we got to senior year. I stayed with my grade, but I went back a level in classes from honors to college preparatory, and then I was able to get back into honors classes and AP classes for my senior year. And I applied to nine colleges. I ended up choosing Providence College in Rhode Island because when I was in the cafeteria during my tour of the college, there was a little person who was there. And I thought, okay, at least this college environment has been exposed to one other little person. 
then fast forward to getting ready to go to college. I got to know my roommates on the phone. I had two roommates I was assigned to. One roommate who was someone who I had met during the summer. And then another roommate was someone who I got along with really well on the phone leading up to our time at, when we moved in. And I participated in this program called Urban Action. It was like Habitat for Humanity. And we did a few activities. It was for incoming freshmen, about 150 of us participated in this activity before moving in permanently to school for freshman year. So I was able to move into the dorm early. And once the roommate who I had talked to on the phone but hadn't met in person got to campus a few days later, she was shocked. She was shocked because I didn't tell her that I had dwarfism. And it was about six months of living together and having to explain that I'm just trying to live my life. I don't want you to feel bad for me. Just give me a chance. Let's try to be peaceful. It, but it was one of those times where I had to start explaining why I was different or try to overcompensate to make someone feel comfortable. And then fortunately, a sophomore, senior, or sophomore, junior, senior year, I was able to find a roommate who I became really close with and is still a very good friend today. And it was also before sophomore year in college that I decided to join the organization called Little People of America. And I found people who had similar lived experiences. I waited all the way until I was 19 to get involved in the organization, but it was really nice to finally have a place to feel like I wasn't alone. And then after college, I, I had had several internship experiences in college. They qualified me for the job market, I would think. But I ended up moving from Providence, Rhode Island to Los Angeles, California for a job after college to work for a talent manager. She also happened to be a little person, so I really didn't think there would be much bias. But the minute I got to California, the job fell through. And what I ended up doing was figuring out how to stay in California and apply everywhere. I drove around Los Angeles. I bought the Hollywood Creative Directory, started sending letters everywhere possible for entry level jobs. And over the course of four months, I sent out 1000 resumes and went on 100 interviews. And every time I walked in the door in a lot of those interviews, I was judged based on my appearance. I could tell that I was being judged because of the body language. Nobody verbally said anything but I could tell the uncomfortable body language. And it was a challenging time, just trying to find an entry level job. I had made the leap, moved across the country, had the support of my family, and it became known that I wasn't going to be able to find employment unless I could find someone who I could trust to advocate on my behalf. And the way that I did that was I went to some temporary placement agencies so I could interview with them and then they could send me places to just go work rather than going through the whole interview process. I could go work and start proving my worth. I did a month at the Hallmark Channel in the marketing department. I worked at a place called Trailer Park where they make trailers for movies for a few days. And then about a month later, I finally landed at a talent agency called Creative Artists Agency. I was there for seven months as a temporary employee, and then I became full-time after advocating on my own behalf, telling them that I needed to be hired on full-time after seeing so many other people get hired. And they agreed, and it was about five years until they told me that I kind of indirectly made it known that uh, being an agent wasn't really in my cards. And then I kind of lost passion for being a talent agent. And I decided to switch to television casting. I worked at CBS television studios for about a year, trying to figure out how we could change how people like me and all people with disabilities are portrayed on television, especially in speaking roles, uh, making sure that casting directors are keeping an open mind when it comes to including more characters with disabilities. It's a known fact that there are 2.5% of disability characters in Hollywood, but there are only 80, only 20% of people who play those roles have disabilities themselves. So there are 80% of people 
who are actors who are playing disability who don't have that lived experience. And it's really important to change that because there are things like movies like Mirror Mirror, Snow White and the Huntsman. There were two different movies around the Snow White story that came out several years back. And one used average height people and they used computer anim animation to shrink them down. And then another one used little people as the characters being themselves. And it's important for it to be authentic because if those average height people are acting as little people, they're acting based on how they think we are. And if their last visual of us was a negative portrayal, that's how they're gonna to try to act. And same goes with wheelchair users. A lot of times there are storylines that say that all, that kind of imply that all wheelchair users are sad, or uh, there may be someone who is acting as a wheelchair user and they think that they have that lived experience, but don't. So I did that for about a year. And then I, during that time, I also founded a brand called Disability and Media on Facebook and Twitter, where I continue to share stories of people with disabilities doing things that maybe other people would think are impossible. So people can see themselves in these representation avenues uh, outside of even TV and film, since there's still a very long way to go there. And then I moved uh, after about that year working in casting, I moved back to Boston and started a public speaking business. So I kind of left the entertainment industry. It was a hard decision to make, but I wanted to figure out how I could impact more lives by sharing my story and hopefully helping others that way rather than relying on the entertainment industry to tell my story for me. And I never had a desire to be an actor. This was really just trying to influence uh, the creative process. I worried about not being at a certain level in my career before going out and speaking, but my sister had asked me, do you wanna come speak to my class? And I thought, why not? And she's a creative writing teacher in middle school. I took the opportunity to go share my story. And then I continued to reach out to places asking if I could share my story. And it was a lot of free speeches before it became a paid opportunity several months later. And what I try to do is share my story, allow people to ask me the hard questions. So then other people like me, especially the younger generation, doesn't have to worry about feeling the burden of being responsible for answering the hard questions. So one of the approaches I took early on in speaking was talking to parents of little people. Like my parents, most little people are born to average height families, 80% in fact. And they were worried about their child's transition from preschool to elementary school to middle school to high school because they were going to keep meeting new groups of people and the numbers were going to keep growing as they aged and there, there were more people that they were going to meet who'd never met them before so what i've done is i've gone into the schools talked to the administrators tell them some accommodations requests that i had growing up and then talk to the whole student body share my story and then allow them to ask me the questions so that student is in an environment that's a little bit more aware the next day. And the accommodations I had growing up in schools were a step stool in the bathroom stalls, one of the bathroom stalls. I also had a pass, because I know a lot of students have to use a bathroom pass only one person at a time, but just because my bladder's smaller, I needed to get to the bathroom fast if I had to go. I sometimes had an untimed test, to untimed test usually comes out to time and a half just because my hands are a little bit smaller and it was harder to write as fast as other people. And then sometimes I would have an extra set of books in my classroom and an extra set at home so I wouldn't have to carry a heavy backpack, especially after my back surgery. Then in kindergarten through fourth grade, I had a lower railing in the school going from the first to second floor. So it was just one railing on top of the other. And then in my household during those years, when I was three years old, we moved into a brand new house and my parents made sure that we had some lower light switches. We had some handles on the doors in the, instead of having knobs, which would have been harder for me to grasp. And then 
we chose an intercom system. So that was also lower in my bedroom specifically. It's always tricky because you think about buying a house and then you think about making the accommodations to your liking, but you may want to sell your house someday. So people always try to find that fine line. And then same within schools. I'm sure schools are always thinking about how can we be accommodating but not go too overboard where the accommodations feel like they're in the way. So in the workplace, I have not really asked for accommodations unless it comes up. So there was one job in New York City, which was after I had been in Boston for a while, I moved to work at the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television Artists to advocate for all diversity in front of the camera. All actor, this, it's an actors union and there are different diversity committees and they were all putting together events to bring more awareness around all the different diversity communities. And while I was there, someone in administration decided that I needed some step stools and really took the initiative to help me out and make sure I had a step stool at my desk, a step stool in the kitchen, and then in the bathroom, in the common bathroom. Then several months later, they realized that what if I wanted to access the other kitchens on the floor where we worked? They should have stools too. And I felt that that was a going above and beyond practice, but it's not a bad idea to have them available. And I'm sure they soon found out that more people than just me were using those stools. And even universal design in general, I think it helps more people than we think. People who have babies need to use a ramp, especially if you're pushing a carriage. There's this example of a comic strip where it shows a snowstorm. There's a wheelchair user coming up to a building and he sees someone shoveling. And he asked the person who's shoveling, can you shovel the ramp? And he said, I'll shovel the ramp after I shovel the steps. But if he shoveled the ramp first, there wouldn't be a problem because everyone would be able to access. So sometimes it's just thinking of the bigger picture. And in fact, 75% of disabilities are invisible. So even those who may not appear to have a disability, it may still be easier for them to use a ramp versus stairs. So while I was in New York, I worked at the Actors Union for three and a half years, and then I had the opportunity to kind of make the switch to advocate on behalf of corporate America. And I just felt that the entertainment industry still has a very long way to go, very image focused. And now is the time to advocate on behalf of corporate America where people are eager to make change. They just want to learn how. Direct competitors are working together to figure out the answers when it comes to being more inclusive of people with disabilities. And what they're starting to realize that is that if you start including people with disabilities from the beginning, they can help be part of the solution of reducing the unemployment rate. We want to level the playing field. We don't want to say, oh, bring people up on this pedestal because they've been left behind for so long. We just want to provide equal opportunities for people with disabilities. And in this work, I specifically manage an index called the Disability Equality Index that companies take to measure how they're doing when it comes to disability inclusion. So it measures culture, leadership, making sure leaders are being inclusive of disability, building accommodations, website accommodations, employment practices, making sure there are benefits that are comfortable for the disability community to help them be successful on the job recruitment, making it known that people can ask for an accommodation if they need one in the application process to the interview to onboarding to while they're on the job. Do they have the support they need to ask for the accommodations? Do they have the support they need to feel proud about their disability as an asset in the workplace? Then community engagement, making sure employers are getting engaged with the disability community and learning about the community. One of the best ways to do that is put together cross-functional disability groups, similar to employee resource groups within a company to talk about the different ex lived experiences across disability. 
So I can't speak for someone with a lived experience with a different type of disability than I have, but I can learn from them and understand that we both are facing adversity, but also not letting it get in the way. And then supplier diversity is a big piece of what we do, promoting self-employment for people with disabilities. If businesses are 51% owned and operated by people with disabilities, they can get certified and work with big corporations as potential vendors. And it's very similar to the other diverse certifications that exist out there. And there's a lot of intersectionality among the, all, all the different groups. So it's, it's definitely been a journey and I really feel that what's really important for people to do is stay curious, be open to asking questions rather than making assumptions. Don't assume that accommodations are going to cost a ton of money because most accommodations are less than $500. But the value that employees with disabilities bring to the workplace makes up for that perceived loss. And investors are starting to ask companies if they're focusing on disability inclusion. I think especially now in the times we're in, uh, we're learning that people can work remotely and can be successful working remotely. And there also will be a time when it's safe to physically go back to the workspaces and people with disabilities can't be left behind there either. It's important to not run away from the word disability. Anyone can acquire a disability at any point in their life and it's important to be okay with that fact and engage with the community now so then maybe it's less daunting when that time may come. And it, it may so sound scary, but it's just a fact of life as people age and even what people are facing during these times, being cooped up at home, trying to figure out what to do next if people have lost their jobs. And now's the time to be innovative and creative. And the best way to do that is to engage more with people in the disability community because they can be your solution and support you on whatever journey you may be going on. And a lot of people may assume these disability conversations are just for the disability community, but it's actually harder to speak to the disability community because it's preaching to the choir. So I do prefer to speak to groups that don't identify as part of the disability community, but maybe their stories will come out eventually on how they may be connected whether it's a friend or family member. And then a lot of just how I live my life is not letting other people's assumptions of what I can or can't do get in the way of what I try to achieve. A lot of people have that view of you can't be what you can't see. And I will say what, even when people ask me if I have any little people role models, it's pretty hard for me to point someone out because I just haven't seen enough positive portrayals of people like me and I'm trying to pave that way to be that example for the next generation, prevent people from go having to go on a hundred interviews before getting their first job and just opening the doors so they don't have to feel the daunting pressure of assumptions and comments and laughs and stares that maybe I went through as I was going through the process. And we don't want people to feel bad for us. We just want people to give us a chance to participate in a meaningful way in society. I'd love to just kind of open it up to questions and continue the dialogue if people are open to it. Okay. All right, thank you, Becky. Uh, let me look at some questions. I don't see any in the Zoom room. In the Zoom room, if you guys have questions, please drop them so we can address them. So I have a lot of comments here. Uh, I just want to give you some of these comments, all right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm glad you got involved in that organization. Yeah, I am too. I, yeah, I'm <laughs> glad that you got involved in it and that was a good time to do it. At 19, you were 19? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, temp placement can be very helpful for those situations. Wow, you've had an awesome career. Um, thanks so much. Thanks so much for doing this work. I get very frustrated when I see able body, when I see an able bodied person place someone in a wheelchair. For example, excuse me, for example, sorry. I'm so glad you're working on this. 
Um, mm -hmm. People are so kind. Mm -hmm. Yes, representation is important. Exactly, that is very upsetting. She's replying to Diana who, about the wheel, someone able-bodied playing someone in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, thank you for making me aware of those accommodations. It helps me as a PR, as an HR practitioner. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what you are saying is transforming the timidness inside of my soul. You are powerful. Oh gosh. You know, I always get so emotional in our group and I don't want to always get emotional, but I love that Charlene. <laughs> Um, yeah. yes, Becky, you are giving me goosebumps. This is from Rhonda. I should have been saying who these people were. I'm sorry, guys. You know, I'll get them all over the place. This is from Rhonda. She I say says, thank you to everyone. <laughs> she says, thank you for giving me goosebumps. I'm sorry, Becky, you are giving me goosebumps. Your resilience and determination. I can take away so much from listening to you. Thank you so much for choosing to share your story. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. Yes, I feel it too. Thank you, Miss Becky. <laughs> uh, everything should be available to everyone. We all deserve to have inclusion. The entertainment industry has such a long way to go. It's based on extremely superficial objectives. That's Rhonda. Charlene says disability is defined not just as a physical, as a physical aspect of a person. I sure feel connected to this experience indirectly by feeling so shy. <laughs> wow. um, thanks so much for sharing. Again, Mildred says, as an HR practitioner, what suggestions can you offer to make the employee application process more inclusive, Becky? So for that one, I would say just really make it known and be intentional about offering to make an accommodation if someone requests one. So you as the employer is putting it out there, make sure that you have a non-discrimination statement on your web page your career site that includes the word disability put a sentence around if you need an accommodation for any part of the application process let us know whether it's an email address or a phone number that you provide there train talent acquisition people who are setting up the interviews to put a line in their confirmation emails when it's setting up the date time and location of the interview let us know if you need an accommodation. And same goes with if they're confirming the interview on a phone call. Mm -hmm. Ideally, they have a follow-up email, so they have it written down, but either approach works. And then I would say, in when once someone is employed, say you have any offsite company meetings or events, make sure you also make it known there that someone can request an accommodation. I think I heard you speaking. I heard, I did hear you speaking on a podcast about a hotel. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in hotels specifically, mm -hmm. I think there's that narrow focus of ADA accessible hotel room and standard hotel room. Yes. And I prefer to have a standard hotel room with a step stool, but a lot of hotels do not want to deliver on that request because they're worried mm -hmm. that the step stool will become a liability. Okay. But if you think about it, a lot of children may need a step stool, yes. but maybe parents don't say that they need one because the parents just assume they'll help them, especially in that temporary living situation mm -hmm. at a hotel. But the step stools can be used for a lot more things. And I'm sure even somewhere in the hotel, there is a step stool that staff uses to reach towels that may be up really high. So I try to make a phone call and ask for the stool. Sometimes hotels deliver on it, sometimes they don't. But then that kind of translates to just the challenges that people with disabilities face yes. in getting out of bed in the morning and just getting out the door. And that for me is when I'm not in my own home space that I've adapted. So it's just all those challenges you're facing to get out the door and get to a meeting on time you're not really, it's not really going to come up during the meeting. It's just going to be like, I'm showing up and I'm going to bring the best version of myself. Yes. But there are skills that you acquire while going through all those challenging steps every day that then can translate to the value that you can bring to the workplace as a problem solver. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple more and then I'm going to go into the Zoom room because we have a couple. Um, I am so speechless after listening to you. You are such a strong person. I feel so ungrateful after listening to your testimony. 
I'm deeply touched by your sharing. And as someone who is disabled, albeit not physically, you're an inspiration to me and that's Diana. I love this question, thanks Mildred, about the accommodations. And then you have a whole bunch of thanks and that Diana says, yes, that's a great, that's a great example. So I'm gonna go to the Zoom room and see what we have here because I see some chatter in here. Okay, so first of all, and this is from Nicole Mariani. I hope I'm saying that correctly. First of all, I admire you. I admire you, appreciate you. Thank you for all you do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she has a question about an invisible disability. Let me just go back to that. Um, she says, I have an invisible disability, neurological disorder. In over 20 years of working, I have struggled to hold a job because of harassment, bullying, lack of accommodations, and most importantly, non-compliance in the workforce. How do you rise? Oh gosh, sorry guys, I just pressed the button. How do you rise about this struggle? Or I guess above this struggle. How do you fight for your rights when this becomes mentally and physically draining? Sorry to hear that, that's just, uh, so you don't have to disclose. I think it's, it's harder for me to totally wrap my head around the lived experience of someone with an invisible disability since I can't really hide my disability. But I didn't put on my resume early on that I had a disability. Same with when I was doing the roommate housing application for school. I would say that it's important to try to find at least one person you can trust to kind of drill down on the accommodations that are required to help you be successful in the job and the accommodations that are maybe nice to have eventually. I think you will eventually need to come out with saying what accommodations you need to be successful in order to feel comfortable in the job. I would say a big assumption and a reason why people with invisible disabilities don't want to disclose their disability is because they see people like me as, with a physical disability and how we're treated in society. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really trying to find someone you can trust within the organization who can support you and get you the accommodations you need. So it probably just kind of depends on which work environment you may be in, but I would especially in that scenario, scenario, seek out organizations that are known to be more disability inclusive and hopefully they can support you. Thank you, Becky. Let me see. Great presentation. Great question. Thanks so much, Becky. Okay, so guys, I'm going to go to my questions. Uh, and if anybody drops something else, I'll check before we wrap up. All right. So Thank you again, Becky. I really appreciate you for being here with us today. Uh, all right, so Becky, Corona Days Professional Development Group, um, our mission is to increase marginalized groups access to employment opportunities and representation in the workforce by providing our members with free training, mentorship, and other resources. CDPD was created in response to record unemployment and underemployment rates stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. My question to you, Becky, is, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about being marginalized or marginalization? Anything that you'd like us to know? Earlier on, I had talked about how when I was growing up and even it, it took a while to become part of the little people community, but then also feel strong about being part of the disability community. And not all people in the little people community identify as being part of the disability community. And I think that's the struggle because there are only 30,000 little people in the United States. And if not all of us can band together and identify as part of the disability community, we then are separated out from the disability community because people try to tell us that we don't have a disability. But even I spoke about my different surgeries that I had growing up. So any of those surgeries could have 
had additional challenges that could add to additional disabilities. And I do, I am hard of hearing in my right ear as a result of one of my ear tooth surgeries. But I, I chose not to wear a hearing aid, but I try to get my left ear to overcompensate. Mm -hmm. But I think, so the marginalized pieces, if we can't even be part of the community that we're under the umbrella of, mm -hmm. where do we fit in in society? And I think we are the last group of people that people think it's acceptable to make fun of and laugh at mm -hmm. because it's just the lack of education and knowledge about our community as a whole. And even a lot of research has been going on about how to eliminate at least the surgery parts of mm -hmm. the characteristics of dwarfism, but it would also take away the pride and yeah. uh, the future of our community. So I think everyone's quick to solve how do we eliminate the problems of surgery, but they don't realize that they're also eliminating the spirit of the community that just wants to be accepted as equal members of yes. society. Yes, thank you for sharing that, Becky. Uh, okay, all right. I just wanted to see if anyone dropped anything before I, because this is my last question. Um, so I'm always trying to catch everything before my last question. I also, also want to say like your parents, they were so great. <laughs> your yeah. parents rock, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially to say like in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not like this, you were born in 2020 and there's much right. more information out or you can Google. You couldn't Google anything, you know? Uh, that That is, I I love those stories. Your parents rocked. Um, they really my did. dad's brother at the time was a doctor and all he could provide to my dad was a brochure that he found. Yeah. But even someone in the medical field yeah. who wasn't a specialist didn't have much information. You know, your parents, they rocked. Uh, they really did. I'm, I'm happy that they did, that they were so strong and determined. Um, and I'm happy that they got that hospital to change those signs. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's, that says a lot about your parents. Um, so my final question, uh, Becky, my dog is going crazy if you hear any. She's going crazy right now back there. Um, oh. uh, I just want to know if, um, oh no, I actually have two. So I have two. It's good. I get to keep you a little longer. So my second question is, um, what would you tell Becky, the younger Becky, either when you were preparing to go to college and, and conversing with your roommate or uh, when you started sending those resumes out or when you were going on those, is there something you want to tell that younger Becky that you know now? Yeah, I would go probably straight to the interview process. I think mm -hmm. I would have wanted to be able to feel confident about addressing the elephant that was in every room. Mm -hmm. And I would try to find a way to do it in the most strategic way possible uh, to still be kind. But I would want to call people out for shaking and uh, I guess get them to ask me questions before we dive into the interview and get to know each other to make the whole process more successful. And then also seek out the constructive feedback. I could not have been the best person to interview in every of those 100 interviews but I didn't never got the feedback. So I was under the assumption, you know what happens when we assume yeah. uh, that it was because of my short stature that didn't get me the job, even though I was qualified to interview at least mm -hmm. for all those jobs. So I would say, try to feel more confident about addressing the situation. Uh, but even looking back, I would say in those hundred interviews, if they didn't want me in their environment, I probably wouldn't have wanted to be in their they environment. They did your favor, yeah. Oh, let me ask you another question about that. You sent a thousand resumes. Did, was this during the last recession? This was in 2006, so it was- Okay, August. before the recession, right before it started, okay. All right, I was like, my goodness, a thousand resumes. Oh, um, because you, your, your disability wasn't listed on your resume. Correct, right? So it's just for LinkedIn and yeah, other so it just social about networks. the market. Yeah. But also, I, I understand that there are people without disabilities in other demographic groups or even people who don't identify as diverse who 
face challenges in the interview process yeah. too. I think it was just the lack of communication, mm -hmm. but I, I stayed determined just yeah, trying to book yeah. more and more interviews yeah. without slowing down and thinking like, how can I be more strategic about this? And it was because I just didn't have the guidance or mentorship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we're here at CDPD. Guidance, mentorship, networking, like those yeah. keys, you know, those relationships. Okay, now is my final question. Let me just check really quickly. Uh, oh, so uh, Becky, you are so right. A lot of us have invisible disabilities and fail to mention them for fear of being judged or mistreated. I have just finally become okay with mentioning my short-term memory issues to people other than my immediate family, but I realize that the best thing a person can do for themselves and others is be honest regarding their issues. And we should never be ashamed of the things we have no control over, that's Rhonda. And she also says, Becky, please come back. People need to hear your message again. You are awesome and brave. Thank you for putting many things in perspective for me. You sent 1,000 res resumes while other people are wasting precious time, <laughs> amazing. Okay. <laughs> I treat it every day as a job. I think I took one day off in six months where wow. I, I'm not going to send out any resumes today or go on any interviews. And some of these resumes were faxed and mailed, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 2006. They weren't yeah. all just uploaded somewhere, right? One day I had this huge stack and I like tripped on a step and, and oh, the whole stack boy. went on the yeah. driveway. Luckily it was a, 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 a dry driveway. driveway. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't have anything in, in Zoom. Okay, so this is my final question now, Becky. Um, what do you want to leave us with today? If there's only one thing, if, you, if we could only take away one thing, what would that one thing be that you want us to take away? I would say just be kind because everyone's going through something. Mm -hmm. And don't think that your something is less valuable than someone else's something. I often catch people when they say, I had this happen to me, but it wasn't as bad as what happens to you. And I always try to stop people yeah. and say, an experience is an experience, a challenge is a challenge. So just mm -hmm. support, be willing to listen, even if you don't understand what someone's going through. Yes, yes, and Nicole says, well said. Well, I appreciate you for coming here today and speaking with us. Uh, we always ask our presenters to come back. So if there's ever anything you wanna talk with us again about, or you wanna get out there, you're, you're working on anything and you want it to be known, Come, you know, test us out. Give it to us first and we will sing your yeah. praises. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right, Becky. Thank you. I will send this recording to you and thank you all for joining us. I will be sending out Becky's contact information for everyone on Zoom. Anyone in the group, you know, I'll be posting it up in the group later today. All right, Becky, take care. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.